let me introduce the panel to you. In the studio is our colleague Anand Vardhan, Raman Kirpal, our editor in chief, Manisha Pandey, the star and award winning journalist, haven't said that in a while. From Chennai is Jeshri. We are going to be discussing the G20, obviously, because that was everywhere the last week. And we have a very special guest who is a foreign policy and foreign affairs expert, Dr. Rajesh Rajgopalan. You're all jolly good subscribers, Sasse Alafas. I'm Abhinandan Sekri. I talk about the global south, uh, the importance of the global south, and so on. Uh, a little bit. Um, uh, exaggerated, or it, it, not exaggerated, but it, it, it's a little bit odd because it's primarily the global south is important because it is the site of the competition between the two sides. I don't think uh, the change in terms of the words uh, on a G20 declaration is going to make any difference to the United States' support for Ukraine in the war. I mean, on every sort of, uh, in every every which way that you can think of, in terms of. Uh, military equipment, in terms of intelligence, in terms of even of joint planning and joint training and so on. I think uh, they just sort of uh, enhance the kind of weapons that they're going to give in. So I think the cunningness of the BJP is that they've spun the G20 presidency as a win. You know, that it came to India because Narendra Modi was deemed so worthy of it because of his charisma, his leadership. When the simple truth is the presidency is rotational. So even if Modi had been PM, if Tushar Kapoor had been PM, India would have got it because... <laughs> That is how they discussed it. The level of psychophancy we saw in the media was astonishing, even by very normal standards. I mean, especially when respect to Rishi Sunak calling him India's son-in-law, he's coupled goals with a big Hindu connect. And then there was like stark contrast with The Guardian, which is actually very critical of Rishi Sunak at the G20 and said Modi had actually slapped him in the face because... Countries uh, with which uh, the summit has been compared, they... Uh, they don't have notions of uh, being a rising power uh, neither Argentina nor but, uh, Indonesia India I would uh, place it in a different space where, where it is trying to make a mark through a, a, apart from other goals a diplomatic peasantry you know I met some media senior media persons in the TV industry hmm. so they were telling that these messages do not come to the management. They go straight they to the go anchors. They go to their anchors, to the, the anchors that they have chosen in each, hmm. uh, you know. Uh, so they are taking orders. So they are taking direct not orders even and even the management fears, you know, touching these guys. We saw all those right-wing influencers praising Saudi Arabia and MBS in this very concerted manner on yeah, social media. baffling. There must be some back-channel sort of hmm. negotiation going on. I mean, you can't spend like 364 days abusing Muslims and 365th day. Yeah. You know, it's a chato. <laughs> Mama, like, yeah. Not an Arab nation, but the Arab nation. On this issue of the media just not even thinking that this is something that's important to do. I think we've gone to an extent where anything that they're asked to do, they will do. And by anything I'm talking about, endorse ethnic cleansing. I have no hesitation in saying 80% of these primetime anchors will not ha hesitate even a little bit by endorsing. So that brings us to the next subject that I was wanting to discuss. Melody, you don't want to discuss Melody for G20, the biggest, the biggest tra trend that G20 has given what? to this what? world. Oh, that's uh, that Melania love song. and Modi. It's not a love song, it's a proper Instagram trend, which <laughs> is, I think, the most organic thing about this people's G Summit. People have really like... She's also quite heavy right wing, no? She's proper. She's like she has roots in neo fascism and has praised Mussolini at one point. That match made she in should heaven. just not meet the Bajrang Dal that burns Santa Claus. Otherwise, <laughs> they, they have a lot of <laughs> <similar> <laughs> things in common. <laughs> Welcome to Chota Hafta. Now, Chota Hafta is but a small, chota version of a complete weekly podcast, News Laundry Hafta. The News Laundry Hafta is where you get the week's news what made the headlines, what didn't make the headlines, but the full version is available to subscribers only. And I don't mean YouTube subscribers, although YouTube subscribers are also very welcome, very, very grateful to you, but also to News Laundry subscribers, the paying subscribers who pay to keep news free. So you can also become a paying subscriber by clicking the subscription link. Now, what do you get if you're a paying subscriber? You get access to all our paywall content, all interviews, podcasts, and importantly, you get access to a full unedited hafta, where you not only get to hear the week's news, but you get to hear the news laundry editor's positions on matters. You get to see their biases, what are their prejudices. It's an exercise in transparency while also informing you. And we have a few quips and jokes 
and agreements and disagreements thrown in. So listen to the full hafta, subscribe to News Laundry and pay to keep news free. Here we go. Angrez apna lagaan aur News Laundry apna hafta kabhi nahi chhodte. Welcome to another episode of Hafta. We're recording this on the 14th of September, a Thursday at 3.30 in the afternoon. Out of the G20, what do you think were significant outcomes uh, that can be seen as positives, whether for India or the region and world in general? I think the outcomes that, a couple of things that came not so much from the G20, as much as from uh, on the sidelines of the G20. Um, one, obviously, is the uh, deepening and the widening of Indo-US relations that, you know, the, the the, the summit, the sort of sideline summit meeting that we had, not a summit exactly, but a meeting that we had between um, Prime Minister Modi and um, Biden, uh, US President uh, Biden, that sort of, you know, it resulted in a number of uh, additional uh, areas of cooperation, including in space, India, Middle East, Europe, linkage, uh, transportation linkage corridor that was also agreed to. So those are the, those are the kind of the major achievements that I see. The one that you mentioned about this new corridor that is being, um, you know, proposed, who will actually put money? Because announcement is one thing, but actually building that corridor and saying, you know, you know, LNT will put money, Reliance will put money, Adani will put money, since he's buying ports all over the place. Yeah. So, and with uh, this Chinese corridor not working out, should the world brace for some economic hardships, some turbulence? One of the central sort of underlying themes of the G20 was the intensification of uh, what is clearly a cold war between the United States and the West and its partners on the one hand, including India, uh, and uh, the Russia-China combined. I mean, India kind of has, has a very strange place in that, in that um, uh, framework, but nevertheless, uh, it is that that is the underlying framework. And sort of in that sense, uh, what this is, what the... Um, the India, Middle East, Europe corridor is is a counter, uh, is a political counter to um, to the Chinese BRI. So it is, I think, uh, definitely there's a question about ultimately who pays for it, but I think I see that as part of that. Such multilateral meetings have to be seen in this context that countries, whichever country it is, follow their national interest. And through multilateral forum, they try to... Uh, um, maximize the convergence areas with other countries and manage the um, sizable divergences that they have with other countries. In that context, uh, the communique uh, was an achievement uh, by itself because uh, that was uh, um, appearing to be very unlikely. So uh, the amount of uh, uh, diplomatic energy India had been putting for last nine or ten months that somehow uh, yielded some results. Second is the inclusion of uh, African Union mm. as uh, and now it is G21. Mm. So uh, that is a, a kind of uh, uh, giving voice to the global south. Because we are in a po uh, position of, say, 70s where... So, Hasni mm -hmm. Heather had an interview with the German ambassador who mm -hmm. said essentially that without a declaration, it would have been a failure. So, we made sure the G7 the made G yeah, sure so the G7 saved the G20, correct. That we That's need a... to give them a declaration. Of course, with, you know, with a hat tip to the Indian diplomats, but also Indonesia, Brazil and South Africa that worked quite a bit on getting everyone on board on this. But right. the thinking was that it had to have... For its relevance to continue, you had to have a joint declaration agreed by everyone. What the, I think German ambassador who it was who said that um, the G7 saved the G20. The calculation precisely was that that uh, a a a, no, a non declaration, a final non declaration, would have been a blow to India, um, and they wanted India to be you know Indian Indian sort of uh, presidency of the G20. That the West wanted Indian presidency of the G20 to be a success, and uh, therefore uh, that was that was a sort of the primary underlying underlying rationale for why that was uh, why the G7, especially. I mean, it, it will probably be wrong even to say G7. It was essentially the United States, and mm -hmm. once the United States was convinced, then 
others in the G7 went along with the United States. I'm going to talk about the spends. Argentina in 2018, uh, this is Reuters as a source for this information, spent uh, rupees 931 crore on the G20 when they were president. Japan in 2019 spent 2,660 crore. Also, our audience can compare what the per capita income of each of these countries is. Indonesia in 2022, that's last year, spent a measly 364 crore. India spent 4,100 crore. And China in 2016 spent 1.9 lakh crore. No, but China in 2016 is supposed to be one of the only like comparable politicizations of the G20 compared to India. Like there, the entire summit was like a tribute to China. And but even by those standards, I think what they're saying is that India still took it up another level. On this, you know, let me just go around the panel and saying, is it an issue? How was the money spent? Is it being anti-national to question it? At the end of the day, that's expenditure on a G20, which is, okay, I want to sound very like horrible, but I feel like international groupings at the best of times are, they achieve very little, if not nothing. So the G20 especially is a sort of loose group of countries with widely diverging interests and priorities. You know, they'll meet a Occasionally, they make some noise. These declarations aren't binding. But it's really hard to tell what they achieve in the long term and in the long run. So, But there were 200 uh, conferences, you yeah. know, mm. uh, which took place throughout the year. So this, the India's presidency was celebrated for the entire year. Mm. And this money was spread all over the uh, this thing. But now the problem is India has become Modi or Modi has become India. So this is where, I mean, Modi in the process got lots of publicity and domestically when you have the election next year so and projecting yourself as Vishwaguru. So I think it was exploited for domestic reasons. You have to look at part of the expenditure as the electoral expense on campaigning mm. because essentially mm. a lot of it did that and I'd like to know the breakup actually exactly that how much of it was conferences around the year, quizzes or this people's presidency having artisans meet people and stuff like that and how much it of it was outdoor advertisement mm. and uh, advertisements like what JSG is talking about because that essentially that the message is clear that I saw the press release that the government of India put out on the meeting with uh, the Canadian premier Trudeau Trudeau uh, which was really bordering on rude uh, clearly relations between India and Canada aren't great social media becomes such a big influencer in foreign policy that a couple of hateful tweets by these Khalistani extremists uh, in Canada become like this issue where now Trudeau and India are on such, you know, daggers drawn? There are some things that are of genuine concern uh, vis-a-vis -vis Canada. I mean, uh, uh, obviously, Canada is a very liberal society. And so free speech means that they have some limitations in terms of what they can clamp down on. Uh, but nevertheless, there is, uh, there have been, I've seen pictures of Indian diplomats, uh, photos being plastered uh, with, uh, you know, with addresses and uh, threats of assassination, things like that, which are possibly, which are obviously not um, not something that uh, is. Uh, I think it's uh, an analogy would be that if you, if you touch the Polish man uh, or or his relatives, he will take the case more seri uh, say seriously. Mm. So uh, the targeting of Indian diplomats in Canada. Th that could have a very personal angle to uh, in the foreign right. office. Uh, foreign office uh, that... Uh, I guess also these referendums that keep coming from the Khalistan referendum. But who the no, gives shit? <laughs> who the gives shit for those know, referendums? Maybe India wants that yeah, clamp down on this. Like, why do you have someone there talking about... No, they no, are but also, a... because but Khalistan also the party depends on the new democratic party, no? And the head of the new democratic party is a Khalistani sympathist. He attends separatist rallies and all. Mm. So... I think Trudeau's party doesn't have a majority, so... I just want to spend, you know, maybe five, eight minutes on the specifics of the post-G20 quote-unquote success um, meeting that the BJP called in the headquarter with the Modi driving in and flowers being showered on him at a time when yesterday after, you know, a fairly peaceful few years in Kashmir, there was this attack where men in uniform died. I think the tone deafness of going ahead with your celebration, I mean, the vanity, it is so crass. Also, I think with Kashmir they and with soldiers on the border, quote-unquote, they've really cemented themselves as the true, uh, you know, 
nationalists or people who care about the forces or people who care about Kashmir or our borders. So they don't need to fight any perception battle at that level because that's one. The next thing that they are, you know, pitching themselves as for the next election is Vishwa Guru. And finally, do contribute to the Monu Manesar film. We have put it outside the paywall because Monu Manesar was arrested recently. Uh, and this film actually gives you a fantastic insight. I think the best ever that anyone in India has got of his modus operandi. Such journalism takes a lot of courage, resources, money. So the people who've done this should be rewarded. Uh, we did this in partnership with two filmmakers who are not part of News Laundry. And we hope we can reward them adequately so they go out and do stuff like this again. Otherwise, no one is going to risk so much to bring you reportage like that. Bas, muft mein itna ich milega. For the full uncut podcast, subscribe to News Laundry and pay to keep news free. The best way to listen to the Hafta and indeed all our podcasts is through the News Laundry app. You can download the app by clicking on the links given in the show notes. So do download our app and get the best podcast experience. And also pay for news and support a new news media ecosystem that News Laundry is trying to encourage, where we are accountable to you because we run on contributions that you make. We don't take government ads, we don't take corporations ads. So that news serves the public because when the public pays, the public is served. Subscribe to News Laundry, click on the link in the show notes below and proudly say, I pay to keep news free.